Uh, good morning to everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I know you uh, saw me last night and it probably, it probably was enough. But, no. <laughs> uh, but uh, Tom uh, Chef and I um, have been co-chairing the committee looking back at our experience uh, during the war period because that was really a critical period in our lives. Um, Tom tells me that, that after we all expressed that this was really something we want to talk about, think about, reflect on, that he went to the restroom and when he came back, he was appointed chair. <laughs> <laughs> now, now we, all, we all did agree on the fact of, of its importance, but he says that's how he was chosen. And then I think he had something to do with my, my being uh, chosen uh, to assist him. <laughs> he has been the labor and oar on this, although we've had a very good committee, and I, I want to be clear about that. But he asked me to uh, start things off by talking a little bit, very quickly, about uh, what we, we were hoping to do here. Um, as we were here in 68 and 69 and, and even before, there were some issues that really were important uh, to us. There were a lot of issues of racial justice and other kinds of issues. Uh, but war, the war was also first and foremost uh, in front of us uh, because and the Vietnam War I'm obviously talking about. So we thought we have three, I mean four of our classmates really reflect on kind of their thoughts about how the war affected them or, uh, in their lives. And that would be kind of a way we would start our, our conversation. So Mark Johnson, Jack F., Mike Allen, and Jean Millard by, by, is she on the video? Uh, audio. Yeah, audio. Uh, Dean Millard by audio will, will be the persons who will present. And then after we uh, have had presentations from them, then we'll have a chance at our own tables to reflect a little bit about the war and its effect on our lives then and, uh, and, and throughout our lives. Uh, and uh, we'll have a couple of questions for you going into those uh, sessions. Uh, so that's, that's how, how uh, we frame it. Uh, and we'll, we'll run through it that way uh, to get uh, get into these very difficult but important, important issues. We, we thought it would be something that uh, would be interesting and would be, uh, be important for all of us. Uh, so, um, Tom? who are sensitive to things other than the traditional events of a college year. We are, or have to be, I guess, a political generation. Cow, therefore, stresses such things as Vietnam and the urban question, since they are two gnawing problems in our society which have remained through this year unbrightened by any hope. His words, when they were delivered to us, captured our attention, and they capture our attention today, Mike, for they were instrumental in our framing this time of reflection today. So it seems right to begin this morning by hearing reflections once again from Mike Allen as we begin this time of reflection for us all. Dr. Allen. Okay. Stop. Can 
Can I just yell? No. Yeah. 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 no. Sorry. Anyway, um, we were asked to reflect on uh, Vietnam. The first word that came to my head was fear. I was afraid of the draft. I was afraid of the government. I was afraid of people beating me up. But the second word was resistance. And frankly, um, my whole life changed uh, the week before Thanksgiving of November 1968. Um, I got a message on my door at Crandall. Melissa Sheldon wants to see you in Babcock. Okay, I thought, well, she's the editor, I'm the copy editor, she's got some copy for me to read. Fine, not a problem. I go to Babcock. In the lounge, Melissa meets me and says, uh, Mike, I'm dropping out of school, I don't want to talk about it, um, but the yearbook is yours, do what you want. I'm like, what? What? So I somehow got back to Cranwell, and told my roommate that I was now the yearbook editor, and he said, let's go have a beer. But then that's what Reed always said. Reed always said, let's go have a beer. Um, the next day, I started to think more seriously about what to do. Nothing had been done, right? Remember? Jim was the business manager. Nothing had been done. Um, I think you actually came into the publications office, and I asked you that question. Has anything been done? Said no. So I thought, what to do? I went downstairs and um, met with Phil Drostrom and Seth Burgess. And Seth is a marvelous photographer still. Um, and I think there was a little joint involved. Anyway, Phil said, why don't you do something completely different? And Seth said immediately, ah, why don't you give me some free film? And that's what started it. So I went to Dr. McKenzie and said, would you sponsor Photography 399 where I give free film to campus photographers and they go out and shoot and bring me some photographs in March. And that is exactly what happened. Um, I, I bought two cases of film, went to the publications office and handed it out. This was in December, I think. And um, we got some really good very talented photographers. In March I got the photographs and I was going through them on the uh, layout table. I think Mark was in your office, I think. Um, Rosie Manager walks in. She had a camera around her. I, I see this now. I couldn't remember at first. But she tosses some photographs on the top of the pile. Uh, two or three of them are of, of an anti-war demonstration in Chicago, and two or three of them are of the reading of the names of the dead down here at the Worcester Draft Board. And I say, I want these. Can I put these in the, in the cow? In the, it wasn't the cow yet. It was the yearbook. And she said, sure. And I said, do you want to be Rosie or Rosemary? And she said, don't give, don't give me any credit. So I did not credit her, which led to some confusion about a month ago, because I couldn't remember where I got photographs, but in emailing Mark, it, it, all, it all came back. About the same time, Mark gives me a poem. The poem goes with the Andy Ward demonstration photos and with the names of the dead, just like they were meant to be. And so I, I put the poem in the cow. I wanted the cow to be a reflection of our times. I wanted it to ask us to re-see things. That's why the photographs. That's why the um, lens on the very front of the on the front of the piece, the first page, and at the end. That's also why the very last page I held until July um, when we had a, a photo of the chapel having been knocked down. Because I wanted us to have that memory as well. That we were, we were the last class to have been in the chapel, in the old chapel. And when we left, it fell down by itself. Of course it did. Anyway, um, I wanted to make a political statement. I wanted that to be part of the yearbook. And I know that a lot of people, some people, did not like that, wanted a more traditional yearbook. Um, I'm 
I'm still pretty happy with what it is. It's, it's unusual, it's original, um, and some of the photographs are really very, very good. Is that enough? Oh, I should say one more thing. Yes. Um, in February, I believe, before the Calgary got started, um, I had a, a talk about the war with my IS advisor, Gunnar Durang. His office was down on college. And he said, uh, why don't you go across the street and talk with the great sportsman? So I did. And that started my punch in subject uh, application. Ray was extremely helpful. Um, he recommended Roy Newman down at first press. They were both Marines. And my home pastor had been a, a chaplain during the Korean War. Ray had said, you need three letters of recommendation from a military man, mil man with military experience, and all of them have to say the same thing, that you're going to be a terrible soldier, and they should never let you in the army. I said, sure. <laughs> and they all did. I went to my, uh, I went, well, first, when I went home and told my parents that I had filed this application, um, my mother freaked. And she said, quote, people like us don't do things like that. And I said, maybe they should, or maybe we should. So my dad brokered a compromise. I would go to seminary for a semester, at least, and see if I liked it. And so I went off to Pittsburgh Seminary in the fall of 69. I kind of liked it. Um, I did a lot of, uh, I worked under an assistant youth pastor in a suburban Pittsburgh Presbyterian Church on Saturday nights, mainly talking kids down from bad trips. Do you remember the time? Yeah. A lot of that. And it was very disappointing and very disheartening and very depressing. And one night when I was coming back from that, I, I just froze. I was lost in the streets of Pittsburgh, didn't know where I was. I couldn't go. Couldn't. Light was green and I couldn't go. But I eventually went. Put one foot in front of the other and I went on. Um, I think if I recall at that time, and this is my memory, uh, there was a lot of fear. And I think there was also a lot of resistance. We didn't call it the resistance, but I think there was. And I think through resistance came hope. At least that's the way I felt about it. Um, I finally did activate my conscientious subjector status after I dropped out of seminary. I dropped out of seminary in, because of the seminar in the Gospel of John where the professor had us develop a definition of revelation. It was a very wide, broad definition. And I said, Shakespeare fits this definition. Why hasn't Shakespeare revealed truth? And the professor said, well, that's very interesting, but we don't believe that. And that's why I dropped out. <laughs> I went to my draft board in June of 70, after Kent State. There were five bawling men around the table. At the head of the table was a guy with curly hair like Bob Dylan. Remember? And he ran the show. He asked one question. One question. After all the things you hear about draft board, you know, introduce. The question was, will you do the work? And I said, sure. I wouldn't have applied if I was, wasn't prepared to do the work. And he said, approved. Somebody must have made a decision after Kent State that it would be easier to get a conscience objective status. That's the only way I could rationalize it. Now am I done? Next will be uh, Jack F. Uh, I've known Jack uh, since I transferred here from Miles College as a sophomore. Uh, the room I was assigned was in the first section, and so that's where I live, and I live uh, in that section. Yeah, uh, so it goes back quite a way. And uh, all of you know that um, 
I learned very valuable, valuable lessons today. <laughs> <laughs> Darlene, Russ, Al, and Jack, of course, were married about three years after they uh, left Worcester. But before that, Jack was drafted uh, into the military, and he did serve uh, in Vietnam. Uh, he's a lawyer with the University of Michigan. He worked for the Army. about the Vietnam War or about war or about military or whatever, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, talk about myself, which I'm told I do too much anyway, but remember, I was asked, the, the, the planning group said, um, to talk about how the Vietnam War influenced your life, so, so I, I will talk about me, and, um, and I also told the planning committee, this is not an easy thing for me to do, but it's very uncomfortable. And I wouldn't do it for just anybody, but I'll do it for you because you all are special to me. So here goes. Um, I'll talk about uh, myself at four, four different time periods. Uh, before I was drafted, while I was in Vietnam, shortly after I got out of Vietnam, and then recently. Uh, where was I in 1969? Um, as, as my our senior started to draw to a close, I knew a couple of things. I knew I thought the the Vietnam War was a tragic mistake. Um, I knew I wanted to go to law school, and I was pretty sure I wanted to marry the lovely Darlene. <laughs> you have to ask her how sure she was at that time. Uh, sorry. So uh, I went to work for uh, that summer here for Dr. Straub to. Uh, and, um, and my draft board was waiting for me. Three weeks before graduation, I got noticed I'd been reclassified away. And in the middle of the summer, I got a report date in September. So at that point, I thought my options were sit tight, refuse to go, go to jail. Um, a major consideration was that I knew I wanted to go to law school, and I would never be admitted to the bar with a felony on my record. And, um, uh, another option, um, go to Canada, um, leave my family, go do that to Darlene, go ahead and practice law in Canada, all of that, um, not, not a good option. Um, but the one I liked was the Navy had a program where uh, you got a three-year draft deferment. That's all they gave you, and in return for that, you had a four-year obligation, you got a commission to serve as a JAG officer. Afterwards, they have 15,000 applicants for 150 positions, <laughs> and I didn't get it. So, um, my options get drafted, which I did. Wow. September went off. And Darlene and I had both admitted, been admitted to the same school. That was part of the thing, too. I wasn't sure she in, in grad school in Michigan, me in law school in Michigan, and I wasn't sure if we'd ever get you know, back into that. Um, so, I got drafted, went into the Army. They put me in the infantry, they sent me to Vietnam. I arrived at the, uh, uh, the orderly room in Vietnam. I was trained as a, an infantry indirect fire specialist, which means mortar crewman. And um, first sergeant looked at my papers and saw I had a college degree, and he said, can you type? <laughs> well, <laughs> no, no, I, said, I had eight weeks of typing in high school. So the only answer was yes, first sergeant, I can type. <laughs> So, so I went 
So the mortar crews, the 4.2 inch mortars, the big ones that are too big to carry around. So I, I didn't have the same experience as, as your rifleman out there with trouble. I, I slept on a cot when I slept. And I had a real concertina wire between me and the bad guys. So it wasn't the same as having to go to look for trouble. The thing about mortars is infantry indirect fire is they lob them up and over obstacles and you never see your target. You don't know what you hit, you don't know what you were shooting at. There's a forward observer out there who calls back in the coordinates. A computation team computes it, tells you where to set the gun, you set the, you set the gun in the right settings and you fire it. And so all I know is that um, I don't know what I hit. I, I know that when they ordered us to fire white phosphorus instead of the usual high explosive, we all looked at each other and grimaced and then did it. Um, so that was my mortar crew experience. In the, in the middle of my tour, company commander came to me and said he needed me to be his company clerk. It's like a type. You know, and I had a call <laughs> and, um, and that, that was really a good job. The, the official title for that one is personal management specialist. But as a general that I worked for later said, I was the radar O'Reilly of the company. <laughs> and it was, a, that was a very satisfying job because I was taking care of guys. I was making sure they got everything that was coming to them, you know, motions, the trips home, the, all that, and, and it was very satisfying in that aspect of it. The downside was, um, whenever we got a call on the radio that a, one of our guys had been wounded or killed and was coming in on the medevac chopper, we called them dust-offs, the supply sergeant and I had to jump in the jeep and go careening over to the mesh, the mobile army surgical hospital, about two miles away and meet our incoming buddies. Now his job was inventory on the government property and my job was inventory on the personal property. Um, my flashbacks go back to those trips over to the mesh. Um, the first one uh, is to include a a Vietnamese toddler who had picked up a rifle grenade and had a sucking chest wound. And the surgeons were furiously trying to save his life and save my guy's life at the same time. And that was my introduction to the MASH unit. And also, his mother, the, the toddler's mother there, who was beside herself with fear and didn't speak any English and nobody had any time to pay any attention to her. So that was what, that was what it was like there. And I would just say that I, I did a lot of holding of hands of friends while they lived or died. And um, in terms of things, little things that stick in your memory, little things like one of my buddies had been killed and being so careful to try to get the blood off out of his wallet and especially off the picture of his wife so that when I sent it back home, his wife would know that he had had her picture with her but he wouldn't, she wouldn't see his blood off. You know, that's kind of, and that seemed incredibly important to me, and I still flash back to that kind of thing. So, so that was the, that was the mass shooting. And after those episodes, it, I would go out of the tent at, um, to catch a breath of air, and I'd see the, the helicopters still in the river blaze sitting there, and I'd see other helicopters going out to do the same thing to other people. And, um, I, and my thoughts at that time were, I was just overwhelmed by the enormity of the logistical effort that went into producing this end result, a mutilated body. And that, that, that was that's what I was thinking about at the time, and I and and, uh, and sort of how, how that um, everybody in the country, in their own way, was involved in this, from the flight attendants on the charter flight to my in my fighting position there. You know, there, there was a, a steel culvert, fighting position means foxhole. There was a steel culvert stamped wheeling Pittsburgh steel. That's where my dad worked. He, that, he, that, made, that was made at his plant. So I sent him a picture and I knew he would understand what I was saying, which, which was, um, we just would like you all to acknowledge that you gave us this stinking job to do. And that's part of the, of the, the, the veterans thing. And, um, and people didn't. Um, as an example, USO sent monthly shows around. In the 13 months that I was there, we had some, roughly 13 shows, we had one American group. Everybody else, all the other groups were from a foreign country. And the one American group was Bob Hope, the guy who didn't have to come anymore. And I'm a Bob Hope fan for the rest of my life. Um, 
So came um, time to go home, and as most of you know, unlike other wars, we went, came and went individually. We didn't come and go as units. So when I get back, um, I was, it was just me, and it, it was this weird feeling of like we were living in a parallel universe. We always referred to home as back in the world because it was we knew there were parallel universes. And, and getting back in Seattle on a, on a bus going down the street and, um, and seeing people going about their daily lives, um, completely oblivious to this parallel universe that I had just been in, was, uh, it's hard to describe, but just a really, really strange feeling. And, and within two months, I was starting law school. I mean, Ann Arbor, Michigan is sort of a parallel universe within Michigan anyway. <laughs> and law school is hard enough to start anyway, so there I was. Uh, right from combat zone into law school, and um, uh, the good news is that the lovely Darlene said yes. Um, without that, her love and that relationship uh, would have been way, way harder. And uh, I joined Vietnam Veterans Against the War, became active in that, uh, and we understood each other. It was a little weird feeling to discover that FBI agents had infiltrated a lot of our attackers, but still. You know, the one we did uh, street theater, we did parades, and the one incident that I really remember best is uh, we convinced the university to give us some time at halftime at a Michigan football game, uh, and the university was all with us except they were afraid if they gave us time they'd have to give the American Legion equal time. But to their credit, they gave us the time. They gave us time at halftime. They gave us the PA system, and we had. Several hundred black balloons, alien balloons, filled with the names of war dead. And our guy on the PA system read the names of the war dead as we released the balloons a few at a time, and that's all we did. And you could hear a pin drop in Michigan Stadium. It was never that quiet before, and it would probably never be that quiet again. And um, the important thing to me was that my dad came down to join us. We invited other veterans too. My dad was infantry guy from Omaha Beach to Berlin. And he was down there, or he came down to, to join us. And that was important. So uh, fast forward 40 years, I'm running out of time here, I'm gonna let you all talk. Fast forward to 40 some years, uh, we decided it's time, I was ready to go back and visit Vietnam. Uh, did a tour of Cambodia and Vietnam, and it was a Rhodes Scholar tour, and one of the things that they always do is they stop in and visit NGOs uh, that are doing good things in the country, and we stopped in at the NGO that was uh, mostly campus in Cambodia, Cambodians and, and Australians who uh, were removing landmines. Because I had two, I had two impressions of Vietnam that I was sort of wanted to verify when I got there. One was, how are they ever going to make these people socialists? They're so entrepreneurial. <laughs> the answer was, they couldn't. They gave up. They gave it a different name, and they have a sort of. But that's another story. And um, the other one was. It won't be safe to walk around in the countryside here for generations because of the landmines. And um, they, this group in told, in Cambodia told us that the year before we were there, which was uh, so 2016, there were 1,400 people killed by landmines in Cambodia, and approximately the same number killed in Vietnam. So I walk into, they had this museum there, and I walk into the museum, and I'm, I'm really appreciative of the work they're doing so far. And, and there inside the museum is a pile of landmines. And I saw it, and I, and I froze. I, I turned white, and I couldn't face it. I, I, I literally, literally turned my back to the middle of the room and sidled around the three walls of the room and out the other side. I, and I told them how much I appreciated what they were doing, but I couldn't look at those landmines. And because uh, all the casualties in my company were landmines, we didn't have a rifle bullet wound until 13th month. And, um, and so the point is, you think you've gotten over the jumping at 4th of July fireworks and, and freaking out when you step on something uneven because you think you've tri triggered a movie, and you think you've gotten over it 40 years later and, and you haven't. And um, I will stop there because I'm going to give you all time to talk. But uh, I'll leave you with one request. Um, never say happy Memorial Day to a veteran.
Jack. As Mike said, um, Mark Johnson was a tremendous contributor to Cow through his writing. And if you read it again, I hope you do, you'll see how impactful Vietnam was to Mark and how he was able to make it impactful and through his words to all of us. But that wasn't the end of how Vietnam was impactful to Mark in his life story. And so we invite Mark Johnson to come forward. Thanks. I'm uh, tempted to simply build on Michael and uh, Jack's uh, remarks, but I'm going to uh, use the material I prepared instead. I'm just saying that my father served in At Two uh, in the Second World War, the Aleutian Islands, and it's been on PBS recently. He was the first person to offer to write a letter for me for my conscientious objection, saying that those four years were a waste of his life. So there's always that conflict within the veteran and within the CO. I want to tell a story of comic books uh, to suggest a very different way in which, as Tom suggests, Vietnam impacted my life then and until now. And I'm actually going to go back a bit before what we're thinking of as Vietnam to December 5th, 1955. And that was uh, the day that uh, Rosa Parks uh, generated what became the Montgomery bus boycott. And under the leadership of uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., people began walking to work instead of riding buses. You'll see how this weaves through the remarks as they unfold here, but we were about uh, in second grade at that point. And Martin Luther King had his first role uh, listening to Saul. I remember I've been a bit of a, a renegade my whole life. Uh, I was in that van that went down to Miles College when uh, probably Saul was a, 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 a sophomore. And I didn't have a driver's license, but everybody had to take turns driving the van down. So I didn't tell anybody I didn't have a driver's license. I took my turn behind the wheel while we sang. There were six or seven Worcester alumni who were lucky to still be alive after that. But uh, December 5th, 1955, the Montgomery bus boycott begins. You remember early on the King household was uh, bombed and uh, the King survived. But early on as well, Bayard Rustin and Glenn Smiley from the Fellowship of Reconciliation arrived in Montgomery and began the process of helping King understand that a nonviolent approach uh, was the only one that would work in the civil rights movement. Uh, Bayard Rustin, like King, had studied Gandhi, except Rustin had gone to India and studied with Gandhi, and they introduced that. In 1956, the uh, director, the executive director, Alfred Hastler, of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, persuades King to develop a little comic book called The Montgomery Bus Boycott. And the last four pages are a primer on nonviolent resistance. So Mike said the, the second word that came to mind when he thought of Vietnam was resistance. Well, this is resistance to the status of being black in America in the 1950s. And we'll come back to that uh, before too long. It becomes a resource tool for preparing communities for protest in the civil rights movement. John Lewis, Jim Lawson, and others distributed it on street corners prior to uh, movement action everywhere in America. It was distributed in the streets of Memphis, Tennessee, the weekend before King was assassinated. In 1965, we're entering the College of Worcester as freshmen, and Alfred Hassler leads a delegation of pacifists to Vietnam to begin the process of recovering prisoners of war and otherwise trying to bring an end to that conflict. I eventually became the executive director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. So I'm explaining every time there's been conflict in the world since 1915, delegations from the Fellowship of Reconciliation have been on the ground prior to the beginning of war to try to argue, A, that Americans weren't interested in the war as people, but there were political influences that were beyond their control. And in my career, that took me to Iran and uh, the Middle East rather frequently. 
So in the September of 1965, we enter the College of Worcester. In November of 1965, College of Worcester graduate and Quaker from Baltimore, Norman Morrison, self-immolates in the manner of Buddhist monks in front of the Pentagon, burns himself up in protest of the Vietnam War. He graduated in 1956 from the College of Worcester. My recollection is on November 6th that the campus stopped and we reflected about whether this was suicide or an act of conscience for one of our alumni <coughs> to have burned themselves up like a Buddhist monk in front of the park. I see faces that say, I don't remember that. An American stone, but it was modeled on Buddhist monks. In 1966, Hasler met Thich Nhat Hanh during one of his delegations to Vietnam and then invited him to the United States to tour uh, following lectures on Buddhism at Cornell University. Thich Nhat Hanh may have met uh, Father Dan Berrigan, who was a campus minister at Cornell University at that time. They toured and they talked about the environmental impact of war on Vietnam, the expense of carpet bombing and napalming, the defoliation through Agent Orange, and the effect on those people. Talked about the environmental and the social and the religious and the spiritual effect of the war in Vietnam. Over supper last night, Jim Stratton was reminding us that the war of Vietnam didn't start with the American entrance into Vietnam in the 60s. It goes back decades before that, and in fact, represented some of the same kinds of divisions that even today we experience in this country in terms of cultures. In 1966-67, Han is introduced by Alfred Hassler to Nobel Peace Prize laureate and FOR member, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. He describes the implications of the war in Vietnam in terms of human rights and racism. King, on April 4th, in his clergy uh, and laity concern talk at Riverside Church, speaks out for the first time against the war in Vietnam. That speech was called Beyond Vietnam. And for the first time, King expands his, uh, his framework for understanding that war in terms of racism. Uh, and its use of um, an other, a colored people, as the premise, a premise we continue to use for war today in the world. April 4th, 1967, King gives that speech. On April 4th, 1968, a year to the day, King is assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. And many people attribute the, uh, the urgency of that assassination to that speech on Riverside Church and the way it begins to shift our understanding of the war in Vietnam and its impact. Thich Nhat Hanh and Father Dan Berrigan then joined the National Council of the Fellowship of Reconciliation and they served together on that National Council for 25 years, writing frequently for Fellowship Magazine and organizing anti-war protests. In 1971-72, Thich Nhat Hanh and Alfred Hassler begin a tour of Europe under the auspices of the International Fellowship of Reconciliation. And I understand this to be a part of the continuing impact of the war in Vietnam because of who it's bringing together and how and in the world. So they're expanding the opportunity to talk about that war and environment. And in 1972, in Sweden, they confirm, convene that Manton Conference. 3,000 scientists from around the world looking at the impact on the environment of war and human beings, the Anthropocene, sign the Manton Statement to say that we're entering a period of environmental catastrophe. And if we don't change the way in which we understand our impact on the environment, we will suffer the consequences. 1972, Dick Nahan, by the early 1970s, Dan Berrigan had visited with uh, 
Philip, his brother, Lebanon, Israel, and Palestine. And here I'll stop to say that I spent my junior year at the American University of Beirut. One of my experiences there with a Palestinian friend was to visit Palestinian refugee camps. One of the experiences there was walking through bomb craters that had been created by uh, bombs dropped from American jets on Palestinian communities. The experience was then to be invited into the homes of Palestinians in those camps for tea and conversation, to see the canisters of uh, tear gas and uh, landmines that were a part of the ordinance there and accumulated in those camps, and still to be treated with hospitality. I came back to Wisdom my senior year, was editor of The Voice, and had the benefit of Nels Foray as a faculty member who had been a member of FOR and a conscientious objector during the Second World War to begin to shape my argument for conscientious objection. And then I went back in, uh, after graduation and spent the next five years in Lebanon. This was the period, well, 68, the 67, 68 was when King was assassinated and Robert Kennedy was assassinated. Those were experiences I had from within a Palestinian-Israeli context in the Middle East. Um, and then I saw all of Vietnam really through the lens of what was happening in Israel-Palestine, and I still do today. I also had the good fortune uh, in Beirut to meet Mary Johnson uh, 48 years ago, and uh, she came home with me uh, after that experience. Uh, we were, uh, our first job was as the, uh, the residents in a a dormitory at the University Christian Center, a Presbyterian campus minister to the uh, American schools, American University, Beirut, Beirut College of Women. I taught at Hadassian College for those, for those years. I want to bring my remarks quickly to uh, a close, again, because as Jack said, we want you to have a chance to reflect, but I want to bring it to a close this way. Uh, I spent over 40 years working for the YMCA, and then in, nine, in 2007, I left to become the executive director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, America's oldest interfaith multicultural peace organization. Talk about FBI surveillance. I had a wall of 100 freely notebooks of FBI surveillance of FOR's work around the country, including at the College of Worcester in the 1920s. So there were student staff members of FOR here, and their work was being surveilled by the FBI in the 20s. 100 notebooks of look, watching the work of FOR was part of the heritage that, that I took on. My predecessors included people like Norman Thomas, John Swamley, uh, and Richard Dietz. But uh, the interesting thing that happened in, in light of this conversation was that in 2009 I got a telephone call from Vietnam asking if they could translate the Martin Luther King comic book into Vietnamese for use in Southeast Asia. I sent one of my colleagues, Richard Dietz, into Myanmar, into Burma, as the, uh, the, the 88, the, the students from the 88 were released from prison to retrain them in nonviolence. About two years later, I got a call from Egypt asking to translate the Martin Luther King comic book into Arabic. And it was used as a primer for the Arab Spring throughout the Middle East. So the, the use of the education of us as American people in nonviolence through the Fellowship for Reconciliation slowly spread around the world. If you'd like copies of either comic book, the last one, being the story of Thich Nhat Hanh and Albert Hassler. There are copies up here. I'd be happy to take a contribution to FOR, but if you just wanted to take home and, and understand the story a little more closely, you're welcome to them. Um, and you may have noticed that about uh, two years ago, John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis, began to publish graphic novels, comic books, March 1 and 2, which again is built directly on his experience with Martin Luther King Jr. and the Montgomery Bus story uh, comic book. So it's interesting, graphic novels have become certainly part of our children and our grandchildren's lives, 
and many of us have started to read them as well, but they've been a tool in this work for a long time. So I would say the war in Vietnam impacted me by making me a convicted conscientious objector. And I've spent my entire life since really working within the context of being a conscientious objector. Secondly, it introduced to me nonviolence as a way of being. Uh, not as an action, but as a way of living out my life. Thirdly, I learned of FOR's work on civil rights, militarism, and uh, materialism as a result of the way we were present to the uh, resistance to the war in Vietnam. And finally, I entered the arena of environmental justice and climate change early on and have remained active again partly because of the way Thich Nhat Hanh helped us understand the impact of militarism on the, the global environment, which is so much. So I'll, I'll stop there and thank you very much. service. 
In Ho Chi Minh City, there is a small but powerful museum about the Vietnam War, including a display of U.S. warplanes and tanks in the courtyard, and mind-blowing, gritty photographic exhibits of the atrocities of the war taken on the front lines. I was sickened to even think and look at these, and felt guilt that I had not ever fully appreciated the savagery troops encountered there, especially those on the ground. We also visited the U.S. Embassy there to see firsthand where the famous film clip of the chaotic departure of the last American helicopter out from the rooftop of the embassy was taken. During that trip, I read Robert McNamara's book, In Retrospect, in which he candidly describes his own diplomatic and strategic mistakes. Sadly, my brother was lost on a training mission in 1973 so I did not have the benefit of readdressing the war with him. But I yearned to learn more about his personal experience there. In 2015, my husband and I returned for a journey on a small boat with about 35 passengers starting in Hanoi. From there, we moved through Laos and Cambodia south to the Mekong. There were three Vietnam veterans on that trip, all of whom had served in that region along the Mekong. Included in the itinerary was a visit to a rural village which had been controlled by the Viet Cong and whose current inhabitants included two men in their 60s to 70s who had been Viet Cong soldiers. One had agreed to invite us to his modest thatched family abode. We Americans were all welcomed graciously with traditional tea, but it was the reunion of veterans from both sides that was stunning. The embraces and tears of the two Viet Cong and the three American soldiers were tear-jerking for us all. The Viet Cong soldiers expressed abiding gratitude as they believed it was American principles that guided the North Vietnamese leader, Ho Chi Minh, with the support of the Vietnamese people to unite North and South into one Republic of Vietnam. On my own journeys to Vietnam, I came full circle to recognize the irony of that war, to feel a semblance of joy for the dedication and extensive sacrifices of our troops, and to witness the genuine warmth of even the Viet Cong for America. I urge everyone to visit Vietnam. You will be warmly received, and you will gain a broader perspective of the tragedy that was Vietnam in the 1960s and its continuing impact there today. I will be joining our reunion after lunchtime. See you then.